Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat, And we're back with another look at the history news headlines to mark the first Friday of the month and indeed the new year. With that being said, Happy New Year to one and all. I do hope that 2023 is treating you all beautifully so far. Today, we're going to take a look at the history news headlines that caught my eye in December 2022. But a few of the stories we're going to look at today were in fact published at the very end of November. I'm going to include them here because I did miss them last month and I think that they are very interesting and worth us exploring together. Additionally, for those who missed last Friday's live, this is going to be the last pre-recorded history news video. From now on, we're going to take a look at the history news headlines together in a live stream. I do plan on doing these lives more than once a month, and that's going to be in addition to my usual Friday pre-recorded uploads. So that means more content and more conversation. I'm very excited for what's to come this year, and I do hope that you will be too. So with that being said, now's the perfect time, and I will remind you at the end as well, to subscribe to the channel and to hit the bell icon that's next to the subscribe button and select all in the drop down that will appear. That way, YouTube will inform you when I've next uploaded and indeed when I'm next going live so that you don't miss out. Now, with regards to this video, as always, I will be using the description box to link the history news articles that we're going to be looking at today in addition to any other relevant materials. Today, we have some updates some new news and a few, not that many actually, upcoming and recently opened events and exhibitions. I am hoping that as January progresses, we're going to see an uptick in interesting exhibitions and events we tell you about. There's also going to be a link to the December History News pin board that I've already created over on Opera for you all to check out as well. And now, without further ado, it's time to take a look at the history news headlines from December 2022. For the last couple of months, I have started this section of the video a little bit differently, and the same will be true today, because a number of very kind people have once again taken the time to share multiple history news headlines with me from last month. And rather than thank them before each separate story, I'm going to offer my thanks to them as a group now. Individual credit for the respective story or indeed stories will be given in both my description box and also over on the opera pin board. But in the meantime, I would like to thank all those who reached out to me on social media and via email. Thank you to Yvonne, Melanie, Robert, Jessie, Anne, Liliana, Crazy Artist Lady, Paul, Cindy, Dee, Joe and Deborah. It really does mean ever so much to me that each of you has taken time out of your days to send me these links and I really am very grateful for your help. So now let's hop into the history news updates, which quite frankly, ever increasingly, and particularly today, might just as well be called Repatriation Corner. Two petitions, one that was organised by Monica Hanna, who is the Dean of the Arab Academy for Science, Technology and Maritime Transport, and the other, which was organised by Zahi Hawass and he is Egypt's former Minister for Antiquities Affairs, in addition to being a world-renowned Egyptologist. These petitions have together accumulated well over 100,000 signatures. In both cases, the petitions are calling upon the British Museum to return the Rosetta Stone. In the case of Monica Hanna's petition, it is stated that the stone was seized illegally and constitutes a, quote, spoil of war. Hannah is also quoted as saying that the British Museum's holding of the stone is a symbol of Western cultural violence against Egypt. Now, I'm sure that none of us are going to be shocked to learn that the British Museum doesn't seem to be rushing to respond or indeed to acquiesce to these particular Egyptian requests. 
Meanwhile, across the Irish Sea, the University College Corp is set to repatriate mummified human remains and a sarcophagus back to Egypt. The sarcophagus in question bears an inscription, which suggests that it belonged to a man named Hoare. BBC News reports that, quote, The item's return will be documented in a creative project called Kinship, which is being led by the Irish artist Dorothy Cross. The essence of kinship is the return of a mummified body of an Egyptian man from Ireland to Cairo, mirroring the tragic displacement and migration of thousands of people from their homelands today, Miss Cross said. So in addition to following the progress of this particular repatriation, I'm also going to be on the lookout for any updates with regard to the kinship project that I can share with you. There's a potentially contradictory update regarding the future of the Parthenon marbles that are currently being held by the British Museum. In the aftermath of reports that the chair of the British Museum, George Osborne, had been taking part in secret talks with the Greek Prime Minister over the possible return of the Parthenon marbles, a spokesperson for the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, stated that the museum's trustees are free to enter discussion with anyone they want, but they are prevented from selling or giving away any objects from its collection by the 1963 British Museum Act, and that's except for under a few very limited conditions. The British Museum has confirmed in a statement that the institution has no intention of operating outside of the law and would not, quote, dismantle our great collection as it tells a unique story of our common humanity. So where does that leave us then? Well, in a further statement from the British Museum, they explain that they, quote, are seeking new, positive, long-term partnerships with countries and communities around the world. And that, of course, includes Greece. While the Greek Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, told an audience at the London School of Economics that he believed progress is being made towards a, quote, win-win solution for Greece and the British Museum. I do sense a momentum, he is reported to have said. So it's going to be a return without dismantling the collection. So what's that going to look like? Indefinite loan, which is scarcely more than ownership in the most nominal sense. And I do wonder if that continued nominal ownership might even require some financial support for the conservation of the pieces going forwards, even if they are being housed in Greece. I guess we're going to have to wait to see. Three other fragments from the Parthenon marbles are set to be repatriated. The fragments in question are currently being held by the Vatican Museums. And this move is being referred to as a, quote, donation from Pope Francis himself to his Beatitude Hieronymus II, the Orthodox Christian Archbishop of Athens and all Greece, quote, as a concrete sign of his sincere desire to follow in the ecumenical path of truth. The Greek island of Naxos has its own looping story that seems to be currently playing out. At the start of December, Klaus Pfeiffer passed away. He was an artist that was born in Germany who became a Naxian citizen in 1980. His death was discovered by police who had been called to his home by concerned neighbours and the officers who entered that home and found Klaus passed away also found, quote, 48 marble, clay and copper objects and 215 coins in the house. These artefacts were examined by an archaeologist who is of the opinion that they do fall under the protective provisions of the law, namely that they probably shouldn't be in somebody's private collection. At the time of recording this, we are still awaiting the final formal assessment of the provenance of all of these items. But if and indeed when that does appear, I will certainly let you all know. We have an update on the progress of the Restitution Study Group, they are the New York-based organisation that we discussed previously in relation to their campaigning and lawsuit that sought to stop the return of Benin bronzes from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. back to Nigeria. 
The group applied for a restraining order, which was ultimately denied on the 14th of October. But according to Dedria Farmer Paleman, who is the RSG, so the Restitution Study Group's founder and executive director, she has stated that they deem the lawsuit to still be pending. And she adds, quote, The request for an emergency temporary restraining order was denied. That was only one part of the case. The court is wrong on critical facts. We are about to amend and move forward with the case. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for the Smithsonian countered with the following, quote, The judge's order speaks for itself. The transfer of ownership has happened. 29 bronzes from the 1897 raid were returned to Nigeria. Later, they, meaning the Nigerian officials, signed a loan agreement. And the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian Institute has nine of those bronzes following a standard museum loan agreement. Now, I'm going to make no claims to having any legal expertise, and that's especially going to be true in the case of how this court may work all the way over in Washington, D.C. So while I am inclined to think that the RSG, the Restitution Study Group's odds of success in this situation are fairly slim, I am very willing to have the alternative presented and please explained to me. Philip Altman, writing for The Guardian in Abuja, began his 20th of December article about Germany's repatriation of 21 Benin bronzes to Nigeria with the following paragraph. 21 precious artefacts that were looted by British soldiers from the former West African Kingdom of Benin 125 years ago have been handed over by Germany to Nigeria. Amid laughter, tears and some audible frustration with the ongoing silence of the country that first stole them. So I think the message and implication is fairly clear here, and to my mind, somewhat ominous. Because in the midst of celebrating these incredibly important and timely returns, the reticence of, most prominently, the British Museum to behave similarly was also being discussed in frustrated tones. Godwin Obiseki, the governor of Edo State, said, quote, Britain has most of the works, and we thought they would provide leadership. They were the ones who came here and destroyed the empire. They were the ones who looted pieces from here, and they should be leading in restitution. While Lai Mohammed, Nigeria's culture minister, stated that the British Museum must understand that repatriation is a turn whose time has come. I wonder if, or indeed when, that institution might finally be brought to agree. I called this messaging ominous just a moment ago because it chimes with what I was talking about last month, what I was warning of last month, when I said that if the British Museum does not start engaging with discussions and indeed with restitutions, then it's not going to be long before other nations and their national museums start deciding that we aren't to be dealt with anymore. That we aren't a place for artefacts to be loaned to, for expertise to be shared with. And when that happens, it will be one nation's cultural institutions and one nation's developing heritage that becomes the poorer for it. And that's ours. Once again, as has been the case over the last few months, the team at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office are back in the news for their, frankly, Herculean efforts against those who loot antiquities and also against those who pay for those loot antiquities to come and bolster their private collections. Last month, we learned that during two searches, 23 artefacts were seized from the New York home of Shelby White, who is described as a, quote, prominent philanthropist, in addition to being someone who sits on the board of trustees for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The pieces in question have been repatriated to Turkey and Italy, but it does seem like there may be more to come, because Artnet reports that, quote, in 1990, more than 200 antiquities from her and her husband's collection comprised a show at the Met, 
called Glories of the Past. Ancient art from the Shelby White and Leon Levy collection. A decade later, a pair of archaeologists published a study suggesting that as many as 93% of the show's objects had no known provenance. Some of those relics are believed to be among those seized by the DA's office this year and last. Now, I am bad at maths, but even I know that 23 is a lot less than 93% of more than 200 objects. So I have to wonder if we're going to be hearing about more seizures and more repatriations from Shelby White's house in the future. If you thought that we were going to be learning from these situations and that thus the collector's market would naturally become much less looty, well, prepare to be thoroughly disappointed because Christos Syrianis, who is the archaeologist and chair on threats to cultural heritage for UNESCO, is publicly calling out Sotheby's London for three lots in their current Ancient Sculpture and Works of Art Part 2 sale. He suspects that they are looted. A representative of the auction house offered the following statement to Artnet, quote, Christos Sirgianis has not been in touch directly in relation to these lots. Numerous times, Sotheby's has called for him to make the archives he keeps available to us and to the public to allow for collaboration and transparency. Should he decide to contact Sotheby's to share the information he holds, we would look forward to supplementing our extensive provenance research. Sirgianis, for his part, countered with the following, quote, As an archaeologist, my responsibility is to notify the public about my research finds and to assist the relevant authorities, not the sellers of such antiquities. The members of the antiquities market continue to sell antiquities connected to convicted dealers because they still choose not to check them by contacting the relevant state authorities. This case is simply the result of very poor provenance research by the members of the antiquities market. For more than 15 years now, it is widely known that the first and most basic step in provenance research regarding antiquities is the sellers and the potential buyers to contact the relevant state authorities regarding the objects which are scheduled to appear for sale. To save face after they are found with such antiquities, they still all state publicly that they maintain the highest standards on provenance research. At the time of recording this, one of those three contested lots has already been withdrawn from sale, but it does look like the other two lots will still be moving forward with being auctioned. I guess we're going to have to see if those lots do in fact get auctioned, if they sell, and also whether this controversy will have any effect on what they will sell for. Will they meet, exceed or fall beneath their asking price if indeed they do actually sell? During the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia, as it was known at the time, a wealthy family by the name of Pecek fled the country. At this point, they also attempted to mail at least one of their most prized possessions abroad too. I am referring to an item we are talking about today. A handwritten musical score for Ludwig von Beethoven's string quartet in B-flat major, opus 130. As it was, the Gestapo intercepted it. The manuscript was then handed to the curators at the Moravian Museum, who were asked to determine if the work was indeed written by the composer himself. It is reported that these curators said no, quote, in an effort to save it. And so, the score stayed at the museum, at least until recently. It would be on display there for the last time last month, as it is now going to be returned to the heirs of the Pecek family, who moved to the US during World War II. A spokesperson for the museum said, quote, It's one of the most precious items in our collections. We're sorry about losing it, but it rightly belongs to the Pecek family. It's not clear what this family intends to do with the score. 
But if or indeed when an update does become available, I will, of course, let you all know. The board of the National Museum of Scotland have voted in favour of returning a totem pole to the Niska Nation. Lee Wilson, writing for the Aboriginal People Television Network, reports that the totem pole, quote, was carved in the late 1800s to honour Tisuit, a fallen warrior who was in line to be chief. In this article, we are also reminded that, quote, in Niska culture, we believe that this pole is alive with the spirits of our ancestors. After nearly a hundred years, we are finally able to bring our dear relative home to rest on Niska lands. The return is currently being planned for 2023. President Joe Biden signed the Bipartisan Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony, or STOP Act, into law last month. This act prohibits the exporting of sacred Native American items and also increases penalties for anybody who is caught stealing and or illegally trafficking in tribal cultural patrimony. But in addition to explicitly prohibiting the export of these tribal cultural items that have been obtained illegally, it is also hoped that this new act will make it easier for individuals to force the return of any artefacts if they do end up being found overseas, having been illegally and or improperly traded. I guess we're going to have to see how far the boundaries of this act will in fact stretch. A trio of 300-year-old idols, which were looted from the Adi Kasava temple in Olandapet, India, around a decade ago, have been relocated in the home of the art collector Shoba Durai Rajan. Art News reports that she bought the artefacts from the Arpana Gallery, but that the authorities' suspicions were aroused after she registered them with the Archaeological Survey of India. At this point, the aptly named Idol Wing Police began to investigate their provenance. And while searching her home, these officers found seven antique idols, all of which had been purchased from the, quote, master smuggler known only as Dina Dayalan. Two of these idols were apparently inscribed with the name Adi Kasava Temple on the base, which certainly lends weight to the notion that they had in fact been stolen from that location. The investigation is now going to look to find out where the other four idols in her collection originated from, as it is understood that they were also most likely looted. The heirs of Hedwig Stern have sued both the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Basil and Elise Gulandris Foundation in Athens for the return of an allegedly Nazi looted painting. Stern was a Jewish collector who fled from Munich to Berkeley, California with her husband Fritz and her children in 1936. Two years later, in 1938, the Nazis appointed Stern's former lawyer, Kurt Mosbacher, to liquidate all her properties. And this included Vincent van Gogh's 1889 painting, Olive Picking. After the war, Stern had sought to have the painting returned to her. And the current legal challenge contends that in around 1972, the Met, who had themselves purchased the painting back in 1956, decided to secretly sell it. Today, that painting is on display at the Athens Museum, which is operated by the foundation of the late Greek shipping tycoon Basil Goulandris and his wife, Elise. We are going to have to wait and see what the court will end up ruling in this particular case. The basement of the Museum of Mankind in Paris is currently playing host to what the New York Times is describing as a, quote, contentious collection. Namely, 18,000 skulls that include the remains of African tribal chiefs, Cambodian rebels and indigenous peoples from Oceania. Many were gathered in France's former colonies and the collection also includes the skulls of more than 200 Native Americans, including from the Sioux and Navajo tribes. The remains, kept in cardboard boxes stored in metal racks, form one of the world's largest human skull collections, spanning centuries and covering every corner of the earth. 
It is also alleged that the museum seems to be keen to obscure or hide any information about the identities of these 18,000 skulls, fearing apparently restitution lawsuits. It is reported that, quote, as with other 19th century museums, the Museum of Mankind was initially a repository for items gathered from around the world. The skulls were collected during archaeological digs and colonial campaigns, sometimes by soldiers who beheaded resistance fighters. Prized by researchers working in the now debunked field of race science, the remains then fell into relative oblivion. In 1989, the curator of the museum put together the first electronic database of the collection. It enabled him to identify hundreds of what he called potentially litigious skulls, remains of anti-colonial fighters and indigenous people, collected as war trophies or plundered by explorers that could be claimed by people wishing to honour their ancestors. It does seem that it's being alleged that this curator was seeking to create a database essentially of what to hide in order to best avoid opening, quote, the floodgates for restitution claims. But now it seems that that information is getting out, which I think is unsurprising considering that the database was electronic. So, of course, interest is being piqued. And so it seems that those very restitution claims may well be about to start rolling in. Our final update is, almost amazingly, not about looted items. Instead, we do have news about those tombs that were found beneath Notre Dame Cathedral following the terrible fire there back in 2019. Among the ruins, two lead sarcophaguses were found. One, we have discovered now, contains, quote, the remains of a high priest who died in 1710 after what experts say appeared to be a sedentary life. He has now been named as Antoine de la Porte. He was the canon of Notre Dame Cathedral and he died on Christmas Eve 1710 at the age of 83. When it comes to the other sarcophagus and the individual contained within, his name remains unknown. But it is thought that he was a young, wealthy and privileged noble. He may have lived as far back as the 14th century. And towards the end of his life, probably somewhere in his 30s, it appears that this unnamed noble suffered from a, quote, chronic disease, one that destroyed most of his teeth. And it is thought that this would have made his last months, or indeed years, potentially painfully difficult. This nobleman's skull also showed signs of deformation. And in this case, this has been explained because it's thought that as an infant, he would have worn some form of headdress or headband that would have affected the shape of his skull. Dominique Garcia, who comes from France's National Archaeological Institute, INRAP, has reiterated that these human remains were not, quote, archaeological objects, and as such would be treated with respect from beginning to end of the research, before being returned to Paris for the culture ministry to decide what would happen to them. Well, those were the updates slash restitution stories, and so now it's time to take a look at the new news. Based on a suggestion from the comment section beneath last month's video, I'm going to arrange this section by historical period, so from the earliest to the latest. So we're going to start with stories that refer to the dinos and we're going to end up in the 19th and in future videos in the 20th or even 21st century. Depending on where the object or story comes from in history, that's what it's going to feature in this next section. So let's start as we mean to go on. A Christie's auction that was set to take place in Hong Kong has encountered a problem. The plan was that this auction would include Shen, as the first T-Rex skeleton to be auctioned in Asia. Shen was expected to sell for between $15 million and $25 million. But issues arose when Peter Larson, who is a paleontologist and also the president of the Institute of Geology Research in South Dakota, raised his concerns, because apparently Shen looks an awful lot like another T-Rex known as Stan. And this is a skeleton that Peter Larson's organisation holds the intellectual property rights to 
after selling it via Christie's for a record $318 million back in 2020. Larson went on to explain that any buyers who were unaware that Shen in fact contained casts that were based on Stan would thus be at risk of intellectual property conflicts with the organisation. Larson said that 95% or more of Shen is actually Stan. Larson also said that the Institute isn't against people selling T-Rex specimens at auctions, but that it's important specimens offered be, quote, true and fair. In response to this, Christie's have removed the lot from sale, saying, quote, that it remains committed to the fossil category and to our standards of research and presentation for sale. Now, I don't want to get spicy, but I feel like we've heard similar statements about being committed to research and being aware of provenance from a variety of auction houses on quite a few occasions recently. And it's not backed up by what's actually gone on in relation to the lots and their provenance. So I have to wonder what that actually means for auctions, for their researchers, and for people who are selling and buying through them. Archaeologists working in southwest Michigan have uncovered a layer of so-called Clovis material, which shows the presence of some of the first people to inhabit the Americas about 13,000 years ago. Quote, The Clovis people are Paleo-Indians, named after their distinctive fluted stone tools, which were first discovered at a site in Clovis, New Mexico, in the 1920s. Tom Talbot, who uncovered these related finds on this southwest Michigan site, said, quote, First, I thought it was kind of a fluke, because Clovis was never discovered here in Michigan before. The theory is Clovis wouldn't be found here, because by the time that fluted point technology reached the Great Lakes Basin, it had morphed into a different style. I think the most important thing is it shows Clovis had actually travelled this far north up into the Great Lakes. You know, Clovis has been studied in the southwest and in the southeast extensively, but to find them here in Michigan is really an extraordinary thing. A collection of pieces of slate engraved with images of owls have been unearthed from tombs and pits across the Iberian Peninsula that's in modern-day Portugal and Spain. These finds are around 5,000 years old, and new research appears to have finally uncovered their purpose, or at least a potential purpose for them. Because it is now being claimed that these were toys that were both made and used by children. One of this study's co-authors, Victor Diaz Nunez de Arenas, pointed out that it is impossible to know exactly how prehistoric children would have played with these owls. But it is interesting that many of these slates do have perforations right at the top that potentially might have allowed children to insert real feathers into them. He also explained how, in addition to play, engraving these owls may have helped children to learn valuable prehistoric skills. Quote, The engraving of these plaques provided the youngest with an activity with which to learn the handling of the different techniques of carving and engraving of the stone, essential for the realisation of other objects, such as knives or points of arrow, used for functional tasks of daily life. It could even be a way to detect and select the most skilled members of the community for stone carving. But these owls may also have played a ritual role, It is suggested that perhaps they allowed children to participate in community ceremonies such as burials, that these owls were offerings, that children could offer up their toys or dolls as a tribute for their deceased loved ones. And if this is the case, that may well explain the presence of these owls within tombs. It has been determined that Bronze Age golden jewellery found in what was once the sites of Troy, Polyocne and Ur, had the same origin. Heritage Daily reports that, quote, a study, now published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, applied portable laser ablation system, PLA for short, that enabled the researchers to undertake minimally invasive extraction of samples. 
the laser melt a small microscopic hole in the samples, which was then analysed for the composition using mass spectrometry. In total, the researchers studied 61 artefacts using this method, all originating from the early Bronze Age between 2500 and 2000 BCE. Although the precise location that the gold itself originated from has not been determined, the researchers have been able to show that wherever this jewellery was made, it must have been mass produced in workshops and was not forged as individual single items because they say this is the only reasonable explanation, for example, for the identical amount of platinum and palladium that they found to be present in the gold discs of necklaces of the same design that were, however, found at different sites. Now, it does seem that being able to locate the precise origin of these artefacts, the workshops, if you will, may be the next intended step for the researchers that are working on this project. Gilad Stern was leading a group of eighth graders on a field trip that was being hosted by the Israel Antiquities Authority, or the IAA, in Azor, which is five miles southeast of Tel Aviv, when he spotted something on the ground. Apparently, we are told, it would have been quite easy to dismiss this item as nothing more than a lost toy. But he said, quote, an inner voice said to me, pick it up and turn it over. I was astonished. It was a scarab with a clearly incised scene, the dream of every amateur archaeologist. The pupils were really excited. Artnet explains, quote, the amulet is sculpted in the shape of a dung beetle, an insect regarded throughout ancient cultures as an all-powerful creator god for embodying both decay and regeneration, as it incubates its eggs in the waste of other animals. The amulet's flat face features two figures, one with an elongated head, evocative of the Egyptian pharaoh's crown, who appears to bestow power on the other slightly bowed figure. It has been dated to the late Bronze Age, between 1500 and 1000 BCE, quote, when the local Canaanite rulers lived and sometimes rebelled under Egyptian political and cultural hegemony. What an incredible experience it must have been for that group of students to be able to witness archaeology in action. A collection of golden jewellery has been excavated at the necropolis at Armana in Egypt. Heritage Daily explains that, quote, the Armana project has been investigating the necropolis of Armana since 2005, with ongoing excavations supported by researchers from a University of Cambridge-led archaeological mission at Tel El Armana since 1977. The dig at the Armana North Desert Cemetery uncovered the burial of a young woman, wrapped in textile and plant fibre matting and buried, wearing a necklace of petal-shaped pendants and three finger rings made from gold and soapstone. One of the rings, we are told, is decorated with the image of Bass, who, together with his feminine counterpart, Beset, is an ancient Egyptian deity worshipped as a protector of households and, in particular, of mothers, children and childbirth. Bass later came to be regarded as the defender of everything good and the enemy of all that is bad. This lady was located in a small shaft and chamber tomb alongside several other burials. The tomb in question dates to the 18th dynasty, which lasted from between 1550 to 1292 BCE. But the tomb in question is thought to date to around the time of Akhenaten's reign. A wooden box containing 15 silver coins from the Maccabean period was discovered in the Judean desert caves earlier in 2022. This find is being presented as supporting evidence for the historical truth of the Hanukkah story of the Maccabees. When archaeologists opened this box, they found that the top half of the box was filled with loose soil, with small stones pressed into the underside of the rim. Underneath the soil, a large piece of purple woolen cloth covered 15 silver coins, each one protected by a layer of wool. 
According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, the coins were, quote, minted by Ptolemy VI, King of Egypt, who reigned at the same time as his uncle, Antiochus IV, reigned over the Seleucid Empire. The three earliest coins in the hoard were minted in 176 BCE, while the later coin in the hoard dates from 171 to 170 BCE. One of the coins featured a handwritten engraving of the name Shalmai in Aramaic script. In Jewish tradition, Antiochus is the king who the Maccabees fought against during the story of Hanukkah. We're going to stick with the Maccabees for our next headline too. This one is about a rediscovery. In a forgotten box at the Tower of David Museum in Jerusalem. In this box were found dozens of bronze and iron arrowheads which date from around the time of the Maccabees. Now, this find, refind, is ideally timed as the Tower of David site is currently undergoing a large scale and By large scale, I do mean a $40 million renovation. The new museum for the site is expected to open in the spring of this year, of 2023. Last month, the Tower of David was hosting tours in English during Hanukkah. Eilat Lieber, director of the Tower of David Museum, explained, quote, These arrowheads are part of the story that we're telling the visitors every day, and especially now, on Hanukkah. When we have evidence, it gives so much power to the story. To be able to see real evidence of the story they've known since they were very young children. And I have to agree, because of the variety of techniques and tools that we have in our toolkit when we're looking to bring history to life in the most profound ways, to my mind, access to real objects for display, and if we are especially lucky, objects for handling has to be right up there for me in the value stakes. The site of the so-called Salome cave in Israel's Judean lowlands has been the focus of a chain of excavations for decades. Recently, however, the Israel Antiquities Authority has expanded those excavations to focus on the connected 2,000-year-old tomb complex that belonged to a wealthy family. The area's name, the Salome Cave, comes from the belief that it served as the resting place or tomb for Salome, who is the woman who is believed to have acted as Mary's midwife at the birth of Jesus Christ. The connected tomb complex has been described as, quote, one of the most impressive private burial sites uncovered in the country. The design and layout are proof, archaeologists add, that the family responsible was extremely wealthy and capable of investing over a sustained period of time. With a court spanning more than 3,700 square foot, mosaic floors and cave entrances elaborately carved with rosettes and pomegranates, the burial chamber is believed to originate in the Roman period before being taken over by a Christian chapel. Richard Whittington, writing for Artnet, explains that, quote, The excavation is part of the Judean King's Trail, a government-led project that brings together important archaeological sites spanning 60 miles. The endeavour, however, is controversial, given it is located outside of Israel's occupied territories, and the IAA has been criticised for continuing its work without consulting local Palestinians. LiDAR technology has been used to perform a survey of a site of historical significance in Guatemala. The survey in question revealed the ruins of a vast ancient Maya civilization. There were nearly 1,000 settlements across 650 square miles, linked by an immense causeway system which, quote, challenges the old notion of sparse early human occupation in this area during the pre classical period spanning between 1000 BCE to 150 CE. This LIDAR survey has allowed researchers to pinpoint dense concentrations of new and previously unknown contemporaneous sites, including 
massive platform and pyramid constructions that suggest the presence of a centralised and complex political structure, according to the study. These constructions include dozens of ball courts for playing Mesoamerican sports and a complex water management system of canals and reservoirs. The team also probed the remains of the 230-foot-tall pyramid of Danta, located in the Maya metropolis of El Mirador, which served as a major public attraction and the epicentre for several causeways. The team behind this latest survey reportedly hope that future research will continue to unlock the secrets of this ancient civilization, and will perhaps discover new settlements that have remained hidden for many centuries. I hope so too. A collection of eight prehistoric ceremonial earthworks that were created by what is now called the Hopewell Culture have been nominated by the US Department of the Interior for consideration in 2023 to be made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The sites in question include, quote, the Great Circle and the Octagon in Newark, Ohio, as well as Ohio's first state park, Fort Ancient, which is not an actual fort. The other five are part of the Hopewell Culture National Historical Park, Mound City, Hopeton Earthworks, High Bank Works, Hopewell Mound Group and Seep Earthworks. The Hopewell title refers to a network of Native American societies that gathered from as far away as Montana and the Gulf of Mexico between roughly 100 BCE and 500 CE and that were connected by a series of trade routes. The BBC Travel article explains that, quote, a UNESCO site needs to show that it has outstanding universal value. And this is coming from Jennifer Altman, who is the Director of Historic Sites and Museums at Ohio History Connection, and who is also the Ohio lead for UNESCO consideration. One criterion for this, she said, quote, is that these are masterpieces of human creative genius, which is where these mathematical, geometrical and astronomical features are important. The other is that they bear really exceptional testimony to the cultural tradition that produced them. However, receiving UNESCO status is a difficult bureaucratic process. While sitting on land owned by the OHC, the Octagon is under the control of the Mound Builders Country Club. The club negotiated an unprecedented lease that extends until 2078 and allows visitors to walk the mounds four times a year. The rest of the time, visitors can access a platform in the car park to view a very small section of the property. OHC is currently suing to evict the country club with compensation through eminent domain. The lower court ruled in favour of the historical society, but the Ohio Supreme Court is hearing an appeal. If OHC can't guarantee public access, this may impact UNESCO's decision. While a UNESCO designation wouldn't entail the return of land or reparations, it does mean greater local representation and education about Ohio's Native American history. It also means more Indigenous stakeholders like the Shawnee telling that story from an Indigenous perspective for future generations. I am not sure when we might expect that UNESCO might make the decision and then announce it, but I will of course be on the lookout for any updates on this matter. 28 Roman silver coins, which were due to be sent to the British Museum to be examined as part of their portable antiquity scheme, have seemingly been stolen. Before they were sent to the museum, the artefacts were supposed to have been stored in a locked and secure facility inside a Lancashire County Council-run building. They were due to be sent to the British Museum for both assessment and valuation. These artefacts were found by two metal detectorists who did the absolutely correct thing and handed them over to the authorities as is required by the law. Now, this theft is being investigated and if or when that investigation should yield results, I will of course be sure to update you. 
Plans for a new highway in Romania, which involved an archaeological investigation, has led to the discovery of a tomb that's thought to date to the 4th or 5th century CE, and is believed to have been the burial place for a high status individual, most likely a warrior. This individual was buried with weapons, but also with a number of ornamental pieces. In fact, more than 120 artefacts have been located, and most of them are made of gold, inlaid with precious stones. Now, these finds are still being studied, but once this current research phase is completed, we are told that a public exhibition is being planned. An early medieval burial ground in Basel, Switzerland, which has been known about since the 19th century, is continuing to prove to be a rich source for archaeological investigation. The recent find from this location that made the news is this gold robe clasp. It belonged to a young woman who died in her 20s during the 7th century. While this woman's skeleton was accidentally destroyed during construction work in the 20th century, evidently the jewellery remained safe and also undetected at that time. The recent dig that uncovered this is, however, being termed as a rescue excavation, as it only occurred because new utility pipes were set to be placed on the site, and so it was deemed to be important that any finds that might be damaged in that process should be located and protected. According to Art News, quote, The rare circular gold brooch is made of a non-ferrous metal base plate overlaid with gold. Green garnet gemstones and blue glass are inlaid on the surface, which was further adorned with gold wire filigree. The brooch most likely would have clasped a now lost scarf around her neck. This find has been described, I think fittingly, as both extraordinary and as being rather singular among early medieval graves. A pre-Hispanic fresco believed to be around 1,000 years old, has been rediscovered in northern Peru. And I say rediscovered because this fresco did feature in black and white photographs that were more than a century old. But in the intervening years, the site was lost, until recently that is. We are informed that, quote, the fresco forms part of the Huaca Pintada temple, which belonged to the Moche civilization that flourished between the 1st and 8th centuries, and venerated the moon, the rain, iguanas and spiders. The uncovered mural is about 30 metres or 98 feet long, and its images in blue, brown, red, white and mustard yellow paint remain extremely well preserved. In one section, a procession of warriors can be seen heading towards a bird-like deity, we are informed. I do think it's quite incredible that this mural has survived with the level of detail, clarity and indeed colour it has, despite how much time has gone past. Now, I think this next story is probably the one that I was sent the most, and I can certainly understand why that might be. Because a frankly incredible find has been made on the site of a new housing development in Northampton in England. And these pictures almost speak for themselves, I think. Archaeologists have determined that this 1,300-year-old gold and gemstone necklace was buried with a powerful woman. It is said that this necklace is part of the most significant early medieval burial of a woman ever found in the UK. Lynn Blackmore, who is a senior fine specialist at Museum of London Archaeology, explains that these items are, quote, a definite statement of wealth, as well as Christian faith. She was extremely devout, but was she a princess? Was she a nun? Was she more than a nun? An abbess? We don't know. Simon Mortimer, who is an archaeologist who worked on this particular dig, has highlighted the significance of this find, saying, quote, The scale of the wealth is going to change our view of the early medieval period in that area. The course of history has been nudged, ever so slightly, by this find. A Latin version of the New Testament's Acts of the Apostles, 
which is held in Oxford's Bodleian Library, has recently given up one of its secrets to doctoral student Jessica Hodgkinson. Hodgkinson's thesis will look at, we are told, the, quote, active participation of women in book culture in early medieval Western Europe through analysis of the surviving manuscripts. And thus, she found herself studying this manuscript. And during her studies, she noticed some unusual marks at the bottom of one of the pages. She deciphered that what she was seeing was the name Aidberg. Aidberg was the abbess of a female religious community in Kent during the 8th century. Photometric stereo was used to further investigate this manuscript. And as Artnet points out, this, quote, state-of-the-art 3D recording technology discovered a further 14 inscriptions in one form or another throughout the volume. Hodgkinson has stated that she will be looking to further analyse the inscriptions and the dry point drawings that have also been found in the context that they appear. She is quoted as saying, I hope this work will shed further light on their meanings and significance, as well as perhaps providing clues about who added them to the manuscript and why. I do look forward to seeing what the rest of her research is going to turn up. An archaeological dig that is taking place near Helmsley in North Yorkshire, has uncovered what is currently being described as a high-status medieval farm that is believed to have had close links to the Cistercian Monastery, which was itself connected to the famous Revo Abbey that was founded in 1132. Jet rosary beads, pottery and glazed tiles are among the artefacts to have been found on this site so far. Keith Emrick of Historic England has said that, quote, This is a truly remarkable discovery. Although we know where many monastic farm sites are located, relatively little is known about them. The excavation of such impressive remains and their associated finds adds a huge amount to our understanding of the medieval world. We are informed that the finds are due to be studied over the course of the next year. Two mid-14th century shipwrecks have been uncovered in Sweden. The finds are merchant vessels known as cogs. These are single-masted transport ships that first appeared during the 12th century on the Frisian coast, although we have had it pointed out that the name cog is recorded as early as the 9th century. Nevertheless, prior to this discovery, we are told only seven other cogs were known in Sweden and only around 30 are known in the whole of Europe, so to have found two more is pretty impressive. It is hoped that further study might identify the cargo that these vessels were carrying when they sank, in addition, of course, to finding out the reason for the sinkings themselves. Genevieve Warwick, who is Professor of the History of Art at the University of Edinburgh, has offered some important context for one of the potentially most enduring aspects in all of fairy tale history. I'm talking about Cinderella's glass slipper. Now, I know that I won't be the only one to have heard that these famous shoes were actually a result of a mistranslation from the French that was caused by the similarity between the words for glass and fur in that language. And now, this version of events made lots of sense to me, especially when we consider that furred slippers sound marginally, perhaps largely, more practical than glass ones. However, thanks to Warwick, we now have a stronger connection and explanation. The glass slipper, says Warwick, can in fact be traced back and connected to the creation of the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles and also to the impractical fashions and fads that were so beloved by French aristocrats at the time. The glass slippers first appear in Charles Perrault's 1697 version of this story. This same author, quite tellingly, also wrote Puss in Boots. For Warwick, Perrault is referencing, and arguably gently mocking, the fact that, quote, Louis XIV was very fond of shoes. He was always changing his shoes, and they were very fashionable, full of bows and pom-poms and fancy details, He was a big promoter of French fashions and textiles, largely as an economic measure. 
That was how France prospered during this period, and the king was very much at the centre of that. We learn that this king would attend his state receptions in the Hall of Mirrors, wearing luxury textiles encrusted with gold thread, diamonds and pearls, and that his shoes were the same. So the glass slipper neatly encapsulates these two interests of the king. Quote, it brings together Louis XIV, the fashionista, and Louis XIV of the Hall of Mirrors. We're going to stay with the French royal court for the next headline, albeit it is the court from nearly a century later. The so-called Trianon guitar, which has been connected to Marie Antoinette, was auctioned last month. It was expected that this piece would fetch between 60,000 to 80,000 euro, and as it was, it sold for near the top of that band at 78,000 euro. It is thought that this instrument was a gift from Marie Antoinette to one of her circle, the Marquis de la Rochelambert Theval, and until the auction, the guitar had in fact remained with the descendants of this Marquis. The new owner is, for now at least, unnamed, as is the future location for this instrument. The remains of a wooden ship from the 1800s has been uncovered on Florida's east coast as a result of severe beach erosion that was caused by two late-season hurricanes. The structure in question is believed to measure between 80 feet to 100 feet, which is 24 metres to 30.5 metres. The wreck is being examined, tested and studied in situ, and there is absolutely no plan to either fully excavate or remove it. Instead, we are told the waves have already begun to repack it in the sand, and this will provide the required wet and dark conditions that will be needed to preserve this wreck for the centuries to come. The HMS Erebus has given up 275 artefacts from the Arctic waters in which it now rests. This vessel left England in 1848, alongside the HMS Terror. They were to go in search of the Northwest Passage, but this mission failed after both vessels became trapped in the ice. No member of either crew is known to have survived. Last summer, divers explored the Erebus and recovered, among many other items, dishware, a lieutenant's epaulets, a lens from someone's eyeglasses, a green box with drafting implements inside, and a leather-bound folio that we are told is beautifully embossed with, quote, a feather quill pen still tucked inside the cover, like a journal that you might write in and put on your bedside table before turning in. The Erebus finds are being studied and preserved at Parks Canada's Ottawa Lab, but this wreck does still have more areas to explore, and the other vessel, the Terror, has yet to be excavated, because it is more secure than the Erebus was. Very excitingly, we are also told that potentially a museum, or maybe a future exhibition on these wrecks and the finds from within them, is being discussed. A pair of jeans from an 1857 shipwreck off the coast of North Carolina have just sold at auction for $114,000. They were among 270 Gold Rush era artefacts that sold for a total of nearly $1 million in Reno, Nevada last month. These white, heavy duty miners' pants with a five button fly have been described as the oldest known pair of jeans in the world. And their possible connection to Levi Strauss and his operation is being hotly debated. And as it stands, and I have read some excerpts of both sides of the argument, it doesn't appear to me that any consensus with regard to the provenance of these particular set of genes is going to be reached anytime soon. Well, that was the new news, and now it's time to take a look at those events and exhibitions. As I said at the very start, we don't have that many to get through this month, but this is what we do have. An online kind of exhibition first, France's Albert Kahn Museum 
have made some 72,000 high resolution photos from a project called the Archives of the Planet available for download. Albert Kahn launched this project back in 1909, and in doing so, he tasked a dozen of France's best photographers to travel the world in order to, quote, preserve once and for all certain aspects, practices, and modes of human activity, whose fatal disappearance is only a matter of time. A spokesperson for the museum added that the, quote, reuse of images will be widely encouraged, thanks to the online availability of a large part of the collections under the Creative Commons licence, which I think is excellent news and a reason to go and fill your boots. And I'm going to finish this episode with a very final, in fact, absolutely final call for anyone who is still planning to check out the Tudors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England that's on at the Met currently, because you have days left to do so. This exhibition will close this Sunday, the 8th of January, 2023. I must say, I am absolutely over the moon about the comments and messages that I have received from people telling me how much they have enjoyed this exhibition. I am still, of course, inveterately jealous that I'm not going to get a chance to see it, but I am happy for everyone who can and everyone who did. I promise. So what do you think of any or all of the headlines that we have looked at today. Were there any headlines that caught your eye in December that I haven't discussed in this video? What about any exhibitions or events that you might have spotted? I would, of course, be particularly keen to hear about those. Are you looking forward to our future history news videos that are going to be live streams? Because I know that I am. And as always, I am looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video or you can come and find me over on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. So please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends. Also, please do comment and interact in the comment section because it really does help to boost the algorithm. Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up and I would love it if you will subscribe to the channel. And if you do think you're subscribed, just have a little check. Just make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, you can hit the bell that sits beside the subscribe button and then also select all in the drop down that's going to appear and that way, allegedly, YouTube is going to tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you can have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.